When one person, for whatever reason, has the opportunity to lead an extraordinary life, he has no right to keep it to himself. Oh, we're not even on the first slide. Is my presentation not coming up? There we go. Now, for those of you who might not know my grandfather, he was just such a man. He was a pioneer, ocean explorer, environmentalist, documentary filmmaker, and of course, an inventor, having invented things such as scuba, the first research submarines, first underwater habitat, and of course, the under first underwater camera housings. He impassioned hundreds of millions of people around the world with over 134 award-winning films and documentaries and over 72 books. But he didn't just impassion those people and connect them with the ocean world. He also impassioned the rest of his family to follow where he left off. After 60 years uh, of having my grandfather around, although I'm not 60 years old, he was around for 60 years, uh, we picked up where he left off. But instead of explaining what we've been up to since, uh, since the early days, since 1997, why don't I take you all on a one-minute dive that will cover the last years of our PBS documentaries and some of the most fantastic places that we've been to recently. That really wants, makes me want to go get wet. <laughs> the oceans are a phenomenal place. And whether you, you've been to it or not, um, it's something to keep in mind. The oceans and water connects absolutely everything in life. I can't even begin to express how amazing it is. The oceans basically represent 1.34 billion cubic kilometers of space. If you're to think of our planet as one system instead of the disconnect that we usually have by separating land and sea, the oceans represent over 99% of our world's total living space. And within that living space, almost 95% of the world's biodiversity lives. It stands to reason that with those numbers, that even with the, the exploits of my grandfather and other pioneers out there that explored the oceans for over 100 years, we've explored less than 5%. Now, just because it's a very large body doesn't mean that it's not beholden to a lot of the things that we see happening on land. The oceans if anything, are actually even more subject to the problems that we see and we face on land every day. From climate change to the overuse of natural resources and, of course, pollution. We've got to remember that this is one circulatory system. And when you're skiing thousands of miles away on the top of a mountain, you're actually skiing on the oceans. I found this online recently, and it made me laugh because 
This is precisely the dichotomy that we face in our everyday lives when we talk about overfishing, for example. You get some people saying that everything's fine and others saying that there's nothing left. We are now actually facing a really big problem with overfishing. We've lost over 60% of our world's total fish stocks since the late 1950s because we've been way too efficient at fishing. Climate change is another one. Whether we believe in the actual warming process as a natural or, or man-made process is one thing, but the oceans happen to be a fantastic carbon sink. So not only are they subject to change in temperatures, but they're also subject to a greater acidification of the oceans through a chemical process of absorbing too much CO2. And what once was a beautiful, pristine place becomes a barren wasteland in a matter of a decade. In places that we've gone exploring in the recent past with my father, my sister, and our Ocean Futures team, 1,200 miles away from anybody, we're seeing signs of human impact. Pollution is probably one of the most prevalent problems that we face on Earth and one of the most resolvable in our everyday lives. We dump into our oceans over 2.4 million pounds of plastics in our oceans every hour. We are quite literally facing a world that's becoming not only uh, used as an infinite resource and a garbage can. I even found my future suitcase at the bottom of one place called Curie. <laughs> Unfortunately, what happens is the flag bearers of the health of the oceans, the, the apex animals, if you will, are bearing the, the signs and the brunt of it through, of course, choking and, and uh, drowning, et cetera, et cetera, to the tune of one million animals or more every year. But that's just the stuff we see. What about everything that's happening that we don't see? Now, unfortunately, our oceans and our planet are starting to look like a garbage dump. These are the first signs. The latest slap in, in Mother Nature's face is the Gulf oil spill. We will be paying the repercussions of that for decades to come. But enough about the bad news. How do we fix it? How do we clean up our mess? If, I, if this were my bedroom growing up, my mother would ground me until I cleaned it up. So how do we clean this up? Well, quite simply, it's about curtailing our bad habits. We need to stop looking at people as the problem and start looking at them as the potential solution. My grandfather used to say, People protect what they love. Well, we need to love our one and only life support system, planet Earth, a little bit more than we have so far, so that we can give back to future generations what we've thus far taken for granted. How do we do that? Well, there's no silver bullet. There's no magical trick that we can just reverse time. But as with the problems that come from our everyday bad habits, so do the solutions. Whether it's downloading a seafood watch card from the Monterey Bay Aquarium or the Blue Ocean Institute and using that in places such as restaurants and supermarkets so that we can be better informed and make better choices to reduce our impact. Or whether it's eliminating single-use plastics such as water bottles, such as plastic bags, and other things that are made to be disposable, but yet they're made out of a material that lasts over 500 years. Or whether it's using social media, one of the most potentially powerful tools in our arsenal, to go and speak to our tribe out there about our concerns 
and about those solutions. These are the ways that we can make a real world impact. I love New York City. Even more importantly, I love Brooklyn because I live here. And it's one of those places that brings so much richness in art, in culture, in innovation, and of course, in environmental stewardship. So let's protect this planet, not for the protection of the planet itself, but for our own future. People protect what they love. Thank you very much.